Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have six INTP females. And so Naisu, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yes, hi, hi, I'm Naisu. I'm INTypical on Twitter. People also call me Cal. I'm INTP 5 wing 6 for the tribe type, I'm 514. Um, I've just been interested in typology since my psychotic break in university. <laughs> and I've been a typology fan for nine years. Um, I really like typology because it helps me with my work. I work for a Japanese company in client handling. So I meet a lot of people every day and um, just figuring out like maybe what type they could be helps me in communicating with them. So. It's nice to meet everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And Suzanne? Hi, I'm Suzanne. Uh, on YouTube, you might find a, a channel that's called The Introverted Thinker. And um, personality, I got interested in about four years ago. And I forgot what to say next, but I'm sure it made sense. It made a lot of sense. And Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Behrens. Um, I am on YouTube as Linda Barron's channel. Uh, but so anyway, uh, I got started in type in a psychopathology class um, when uh, I was in my master's program. So I learned about the way people go become dysfunctional. And we took the Myers Briggs. Um, and we could take it if we wanted to. And then I didn't learn anything about what the letters meant for quite a while, because it was all about uh, temperament, because David Kersey was my professor. And then I just became a school psychologist and therapist, and then I started my own business and have been obsessed with type for, uh, let me see. <laughs> I, th I think that's been about 45 years or so at mm. least. So that's my life work. I adore your books, Linda Behrens. Mm -hmm. And she also has a certification called Interstrength that you can check out in the links below. And she's a amazing gal who oh, has an a, equally fantastic certification program. So go check it out. If you want to learn more about type and interaction styles, which is a Linda Behrens specialty, go and check the links below. That's because I married a saint and who puts up with me and lets me do that. That's excellent. <laughs> and Rebecca? Hi, Rebecca Sarver. Um, I am a uh, people development practitioner. That's what I've decided to call myself um, because uh, coach just doesn't quite fit for me. Um, I've been on my own for um, almost four years now starting up my own company. And I've really used uh, Linda's work, Inner Strength, to um, help me out as one of the really important lenses. So I first uh, became a part of the type community back in probably the early 90s, and then kind of went away and then came back um, a couple of uh, years ago. And um, it's one of the things that I've carried through for all those um, all those years that has helped me make sense of not just myself, but other people as well. Really, really great. <laughs> and Cheryl? Hi, I learned that I had INTP preferences when I was in my 20s. And it was kind of a aha moment, like it was really nice to be able to see something written on paper reflected back to me that represented a big part of who I was. And um, I actually had fallen in the middle of uh, sensing it and intuition. And so I had to look at both sides to determine which one I was. Um, but it was, um, I think that there was like a kind of a level of recognition in that, you know, that it represented more about like who I was than any gender stereotype that I grew up with ever did. So I found that it was very valuable. I didn't really start studying it until much later in life, like in, in much more depth. Um, but yeah, so I just, I really did appreciate that, um, that there's this finer way of sort of categorizing parts of who we are that can better match 
like who we are. And, uh, you know, I was really nervous to come on here because it's really deeply uncomfortable for me, which is why I have my camera off. I mean, I have my camera off. I have my like uh, laptop tip back so that it would point at the ceiling in case I accidentally turn my camera on. And I have a shirt over my camera just in case like those two things happen. So um, I thought, you know, at least for me, this was like a way to um, represent a lot of people who are like me who wouldn't normally do something like this, but I'm taking it on as a personal growth uh, experience. And I thought that, you know, my voice should be heard because there really aren't very many INTP females. And um, I really uh, respect and admire the integrity of the work that you do, Joyce. There are so many um, uh, parts and pieces to what you do, you know, that you really deeply care about the accuracy of your work and you don't want to misrepresent anybody. And then, you know, before we came on here, we were informed that if there was anything that we shared that we felt uncomfortable with, that we could edit that out. And that's so valuable to me because, and I don't know if you want to share that with all of your viewers, maybe you have to cut this down, but, um, but yeah, I just, uh, it makes the process a lot easier. So thank you for being a you and doing what you're doing. I think you're really adding a valuable service. Thanks for the warm fuzzies in my heart. <laughs> we're, happy to, <laughs> we're happy to grow with you and to be on your growth journey with you. This is amazing. <laughs> we can all get out of our comfort zone together. <laughs> thank you, Joyce. Yay. And Susan? Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm a... Uh, uh, software developer um, for about, I guess, 25 years. Um, also, um, I guess about 20 years ago, I got a CFP. I'm also a certified financial planner because I realized the age discrimination that was going on in software development and outsourcing that it was very possible that when I got to my 50s, I might not be able to get a job programming. So I was thinking, well, being, you know, and also I had a lot of big interest in financial planning because I was working at a lot of uh, banking financial institutions on trading systems and things at the time. And so I had a big interest in it and I like to help people. So I got the CFP. Um, then about uh, seven years ago, I um, found out about, I had known about type since I was 30 when I came out as kind of a IXTP because I have, strong sensing, I think probably partly because of the programming and then also maybe music that I sort of college is a double major music and computer science because so I don't know if any of that had anything to do with it. But I found the cognitive function seven years ago. And when I read that and I finally got to understand that, then I was like, oh, this is amazing because that explains so much. And then I realized, oh, well, I'm definitely an INTP and not an ISTP because yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's seeing, the, seeing the functions, the differences, there's there's that. So um, so one of the things also I've been studying intensely just because it helps me so much in my life and it also helps other people because if, you know, it's friends of mine where I, I'll explain it to them and, and they thank me for like helping them know more about this because they, they realize that, you know, why they do certain things that they do and, and other people too. So it, it helps me understand myself and others. And I also thought, you know, the more I learn about this, I could put potentially if I do use the CFP and start being a financial planner to integrate uh, type into doing financial planning is kind of an integrated type of thing. So that's kind of. Yeah, fascinating background, Susan. Feel free to check out all these lovely INTP women in the description box below. Linda Behrens has an amazing certification program called InterStrengths. You will not regret it if you check it out. And Suzanne has a wonderful INTP female channel as well, if you want to check out that. And Naisu has a Twitter account. Yeah. And my name is Joyce. I am a certified MBTI practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. On to the first question. What was it like to have INTP preferences growing up as a woman? What works and what was a little more challenging? Hmm. Um, I'll go first by order. <laughs> uh, I guess my I'm I'm the first child, and my my parents weren't prepared for how in well, what do you call this like inquisitive. I was. Um, my mother shared with me just recently that while she was they were raising me as a as a toddler she actually wrote to some of her friends 
asking, is this normal for your first child to be this way? <laughs> um, I make everybody in my family nervous just talking to me because I, I correct a lot of people. And apparently I've been this way since I was young. Um, and it, it's more like a lot, a lot of like fact checking everybody when they talk. Uh, it was very difficult to make friends, for sure. I have been told a lot um, by peers that it's very frightening to to just connect with me because, like, I'll ask them like questions that they're actually not comfortable with, and I don't know that it's actually making them uncomfortable. So it was a lot of those things. Mm. Uh, I, I specifically remember this one encounter when I was like in, in elementary and I, <laughs> it, it was more of like, I don't know the English word, um, ah, tactless, tactless, is that a word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm, somebody just like told me straight up like the reason why nobody wants to talk to you is because you're so tactless and that didn't really hurt me emotionally but like it got me to thinking like are all of my are all of my uh i know interactions this way and for a whole year i didn't want to talk to everybody because i just wanted to study everybody's social interaction styles around me before i start talking to people again but like i think she took that she took the girl who told me that she took that to heart of like her hurting me and so for graduations um she apologized to me and i i actually told her like oh that that actually didn't hurt me i'm actually very grateful you pointed that out so yeah it's a lot of that. <laughs> it's almost like other people are afraid to tell you things, but you're actually mm. like, you appreciate the truth. <laughs> and so do. it's like, yeah, yeah it's, that's helpful. Thank you. And they're mm. like, oh, I thought that would hurt your feelings. And you're like, that was no, that was really good information. <laughs> it was helpful. It was very helpful. I, I guess it was like a lot of me thinking I was very normal. And then a lot of people around me telling me that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was it was helpful because like it's very hard for me to be aware especially at a younger age like aware of like just generally people i guess mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay next one <laughs> i guess it's me then um the way the experience back then compared to how i think about it now is very different because back then it wasn't very easy in not cracking the social codes of the other girls my age. And also my way of being didn't quite fit in. Like I remember especially one instance, it was in fifth grade. I was asking my question, my, my teacher questions he didn't like, and it took me out on the hallway to talk to me. And he asked me, who do you think you are? Or I responded, who do you think you are? Which result resulted in a letter home. So um, back then, I, was, I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, the friends I had were mostly boys, and there was like this one girl. I'm pretty sure she was an ISTJ. That was like my trusted, true, only friend, so to speak, when I was really young. Um, and that lasted, yeah, pretty much my whole youth. Really interesting. <laughs> I find ISTJ friends to be very loyal. I find SJ temperament friends are like, they tend to stay in my life longer than mm. other friends. Yeah. Like my ISTJ friend will still contact me every once in a while, which is like a certain type of consistency I don't normally get with my other friends. So I, I got to give it to the ISTJs for being, you know, stand up, reliable, consistent friends. <laughs> I, I don't remember. I, I wrote in one of your chats this one thing. This was the same ISTJ who all of a sudden she came late for school and her parents could, you couldn't figure out why because she would always leave 30 minutes ahead of time. She was late because she stopped at my house to make sure I got to school. <laughs> so um, 
not that great at the time, but all in all, that was the way it was for natural explanations. Gotta love yeah. ISTJs. My ISTJ friend would ping me every week to make sure I filed my taxes correctly. She's like, okay, Joyce, you have to contact the government right now. <laughs> I, and I'm going to remind you until you actually do it. <laughs> and it was really lovely. SJ love. <laughs> and Linda? Okay, so it was a longer time ago than anybody here. <laughs> but, um, I, I grew up in a small town in Kansas population 1100 so I think there were I don't know 24 in my graduating class um, but like Suzanne said I had a lot of trouble cracking that social code and I did argue with my teachers it's one of the things I was proud of when I did my career search work you know you list the things you're proud of but was that I corrected a teacher now I understand that I was just teaching something that she wasn't ready for the class to learn, but I didn't think she was very smart, so that was a problem. Um, I was always a good student, so that was helpful. And, um, well, as long as I could study at the last minute, which is still the case for me. Um, I had I had quite a few friends and, you know, not, um, but the dating scene was not comfortable for me. Um, but I had quite a few. Um, man, we did things together, stuff like that. Um, I think some of them thought I was weird, but I also was a confidant to a lot of people, which maybe foreshadowed, foreshadowed the therapy training I went into. Um, I do remember... Um, going to college, and then, then it was even harder the social stuff, and I was in a scholarship hall, so I was expected to act like a sorority. You know, we were supposed to have teas and things like that, and I pretended I was sick and went over to my now husband's apartment and studied and worked on a paper <laughs> instead of being part of the tea. Um, luckily, I married, I, I, I met my husband when I was 19. So we've been married 57 years. Um, so INTP to INTP, that helps. Um, you know, so I would say that growing up was, I, I did always feel defective. Like there was something wrong with me in some ways and in other ways I was a little bit arrogant about um, who I was and especially in regards to teachers and I hated teachers that were like the one that made us crawl, you know, uh, you sit crawl, like you go like this all the way across the gym floor. You know, she would be totally out of inconsistent and out of whack and I hated gym anyway, so. Yeah, so that was, you know, I would say I got a lot of messages, you're really not okay and that continued on through um, young adulthood. Like I felt like I didn't fit in my neighborhood. I would go, neighbor sit at my neighbor's kitchen while she cleaned and chattered 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 and talked while our kids played together but I didn't really feel like I knew what to say so yeah that was it yeah there seems to be this theme with INTPs and feeling that urge to correct people or clarify when things don't make sense. And mm -hmm. it's like, hey, that mm -hmm. really doesn't make sense. <laughs> and the NE, the extroverted intuition is inquisitive and it wants to kind of understand it and explore the idea more. And sometimes other mm -hmm. people kind of see that as challenging authority when it's really, you want to help make logic more clean for, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Actually, excuse me. Um, I was really ashamed to add this because maybe it's just me being Asian, but I didn't want to add that I would quarrel with my teachers. And I actually <laughs> had like three teachers quit because of me in, in high school. <laughs> and I've always been deeply ashamed of, because of that. <laughs> I had my English teacher quit. I had my math teacher quit. And then my computer science teacher quit because I, I would correct them face to face in the classroom. 
So when you mentioned that, that that actually made me feel a bit better. <laughs> so thanks for sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the TI notices the incompetency in the other person. And so it's trying to rectify the incompetency. <laughs> and and mm -hmm. that's also theorist that, you know, the essential motor pattern is not made up of the color. It, it isn't a composite of the cognitive processes. It's something separate, but the processes serve it. So the theorist really wants to be competent and wants others to be competent. And so it's yeah. really irritating when they're not. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And with my INTP friends, when they take the strengths finder, I notice a common strength that INTPs get is restorative. And what restorative is, it's kind of finding flaws and finding fault in other people's arguments or finding inconsistencies within another person's thoughts. And INTPs tend to score really high on restorative in the strengths finder as a trend, not a rule as a trend. <laughs> And Rebecca? Um, so similar experience to what has gone before being um, argumentative um, because I always knew I was right. Um, I've lost that cockiness and that confidence um, as I got older, but certainly in my youth, I always knew when I was right and you weren't going to prove me wrong. Um, I think John Beebe made the comment that INTP children raise themselves and that really does apply to me. So oftentimes um, I was the uh, first born child, um, but I took on um, in many ways more of a parental role as I was um, growing up. I always knew that I didn't fit in, um, but I can't say that that really bothered me all that much. Um, but I remembered in high school talking to my mother and say, and I didn't go to any of the parties or any of that stuff because they just seemed stupid to me. Um, I couldn't understand why people would drink and then throw up and talk about what a great time they had. I mean, I, I, I it just didn't compute for me. And I, but I remember saying to my mother, you know, yeah, I get along with with all the the you know even the the girls who are really the in girls and all that. And she goes. <laughs> Well, that's because you um, are no competition for any of the boys for them. And it was like, okay, mom, thanks. Um, but she was right. So for me, dating was extremely awkward. Um, I, I didn't want to waste my time. It just seemed like a kind of a waste of time thing. Um, and a lot of that changed when I hit um, college. So for me, grade school and high school was one period. And then college was um, very different for me. I kind of had my social awakening um, happen in college. Oh, although, well, that was another thing my parents said was that I tried to cram four years of what I should have been doing in high school into my first year of college. So I was trying to make up for all of that. Fascinating. And so something Rebecca mentioned in the beginning is really interesting. She mentioned she always knew she was right. And so this goes to personality hackers firm model. And so the IPs, and so this would also be the INTPs too, they have a fixation on rightness. And so with TI as a first function, it can kind of have this immediate judgment that they might be the one right in a situation. And so it can be hard to, it takes a while to kind of understand. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Wait, I was going somewhere with that. <laughs> so- I mean, um, I want to stop. Mm, mm, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well said. And Cheryl? Okay. Um, it's really interesting to hear the answers. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, being in, you know, being in class and they would always ask you to go around and say your name and say something about yourself. And I'd always get like more and more nervous as like it approached me. Um, but it's always helpful to kind of hear what other people are, are focusing on to see what is similar and what's different. Um, I was the <clears throat> I was the youngest child in my family. So when I went to kindergarten, it was sort of the first opportunity I had to observe other kids that were my age. 
Um, I mean, there were kids in the neighborhood, but I don't think I had a lot of freedoms uh, when I was that young. Uh, so I recall spending a lot of time just observing. Uh, specifically, there was an area of the kindergarten classroom that had a playhouse, and there was a group of children who would go over there and they would play house, and there would be the mother and the father and the brother and the sister and the cat and the dog. And they would all have these roles and sometimes they would just switch. Like suddenly somebody would say, now I wanna be the cat. And they would all sort of fall into a new role. And observing it, I was, to me, I think what I was trying to do was understand what the rules were and like make sense. It was like uh, trying to theorize about this game that they were playing. Cause to me, it, it almost made no sense. Um, and so I, th I remember trying to join in and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go in, I'm going to be the cat. You know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to be the cat. And I'd go in and I'd go, okay, I'm the cat. And I'd go, no, we already have a cat. Okay, can I be the dog? No, we are, we already have a dog, <laughs> you know? And so I'd like take a step back and go, okay, you know, regroup and sort of like just watch them and observe and try to figure out what the rules were. And so like, how, how do I participate? But realistically, I think I was happier to just observe and watch them. And I always thought it was very interesting because it seemed like this like singular organism with multiple moving parts. Um, like they all shared a common brain or something. And it was, it was so fascinating to me um, because I felt more like an isolated being, like just an individual that was more self-contained. Um, and they seemed like somehow like interconnected on the outside. Um, so I do recall that being in kindergarten, being very observant um, of how children play. And uh, once we left kindergarten in the first grade, we were allowed onto the big playground. Uh, and this was the first time where I really got to observe older children. And I just recall watching them leave their classrooms. And some of the children would leave with like just this huge smile. I re specifically remember one child left the classroom and just started running out of the classroom with this huge smile and screaming. And I thought, where are they going? And why are they so excited? Like, I didn't understand um, what all of this emotion was about. Um, but yeah, I think, I think beginning in around third grade, I started to have some conflict with instructors. Um, my teacher had a, uh, she had a, um, well, what's the word? Um, she would have us do a group reading where each student would read one sentence in the book. And then the next student would read the next sentence and then the next, the next. And so everybody in the class would take a turn and it was really mind numbing and I could not stay focused. So my mind would start to wander and I'd start to daydream. And then I would get in trouble because it would be my turn and I had no idea where we were, where we were in the book. Um, so then what I did was I, re I recognized that she had a pattern. There was a sheet on her desk and we had these modules, like there would be four desks together in a group. Uh, so there'd be, you know, several modules. And so she'd go from one to the next and she always had the same order within that module. So I could count out the number of people that were ahead of me, and then I would count out the number of sentences ahead in the book, and I would actually memorize the sentence. Um, so whether I was keeping up or not, like I was then free to daydream and go to wherever I needed to be or wanted to be. Um, but I just really thought that that um, I thought that it was just the most ridiculous assignment, you know, to to give a class. Um, there were people who were really far behind. And I felt, I actually kind of, I mean, I must have had some empathy, right, even back then, but I did feel bad for one of my fellow students who really struggled. And I think that made the, the assignment or the project even more, you know, I, I disliked it even more and I disliked the teacher even more. So I recall at one time, I, I guess it was kind of like a a silent, um, what do you call it? Like when you're objecting or um, protesting, like a silent protest where I actually memorized my sentence really far ahead 
And I closed my book and I slid it to the top of my desk and I sat there and I just waited. And she was getting more and more angry. And she would look at me and she just like her body was shaking and her head was shaking and she was so like, like upset. And finally it was my turn and she, and she called on me and I read my sentence out loud. I mean, I didn't read it, but I just recited my sentence out loud. And um, I don't know if it was the next day or the next week, but I was put into another class. <laughs> so <laughs> she, I guess she kind of had it with me. Uh, but she actually, they put me in the next level up. They put me into the fourth grade for the remainder of the year. Um, so that was that was kind of my experience with silently protesting and being a difficult student. Um, and with regard to other students or like other, my peers um, and friendships, I, I just re recall like having a few people that I felt Sort of attached to that I could connect with along the way in elementary school. I, I thought of a lot of people as sort of like more like acquaintances. Um, I didn't really think to define people in different categories of acquaintances or friends, but um, there was one time when there were these monkey bars, and this was later where I, I, I kind of I started to develop an interest in doing the, the monkey bars and we would, there were two bars and there would be like three or four girls on each of them that would fit across. And one day there was this person who I considered to be my friend and we had a little bit of an argument. I don't remember what it was about, but she said, you know, um, everybody that is my friend, you know, come over to my side and be with me. And everybody that's Cheryl's friend, you go over there and be with Cheryl and her bar. And I watched everybody leave my bar and go over to her side. And I was like, wow, my first thought was, wow, you know, I, these are all people I kind of thought were my friend. Um, that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, oh, cool. I, I get the whole bar to myself. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, I mean, it was kind of hurtful, but it was also really eye opening um, that maybe I need to make some adjustments you know, and who I am or how I present myself to other people in order to be more accepted by them. Um, and yeah, I, I think that I think that those kinds of experiences that shape us give us an opportunity f for growth. And I think that as an INTP female, uh, compared to our male counterparts, that we would be more likely to have come across those kinds of experiences because of what is expected of us in our social sphere. But yeah, that's my elementary school experience list. <laughs> that's super interesting, Cheryl. Susan has said something similar before in terms of friends. I think I had a talk with Susan about how people call so many people their friends, but <laughs> would you like to go into that? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And actually I was going to follow up on that because it's the same thing you know, that Cheryl said about the acquaintances. Um, though, though, though first I wanted to go on uh, uh, the, the, that several other people said, which I never did. I never argued with the teacher. I never raised my hand in class from elementary school through high school, through college any class ever or ask the question but then I think part of that is I have social anxiety so besides being an INTP I have you know I had and it was much worse when I was young I had social anxiety I just I never wanted to ask any questions I never wanted to like you know bring up anything so and I hated getting asked called on in class too even if I knew the answer I hated that too so, so I think the social anxiety did a lot of that where I just, you know, I just kind of just kept to myself. And so I think teachers just love me because I would just quietly just sit there, just get my work done. And usually also in class where um, I would do my homework in class. And if the teacher didn't put it up for that class at the beginning of class, they, it was for the previous one. So I never did homework at home. I always did it during school because usually I'd like pick things up so quickly where 
I would do homework for the previous classes during the next classes. So maybe they thought I was taking notes or something. Or if I didn't have any homework to do, I would have maybe, this was actually high school, have a paperback book and I'd have it under the desk and I'd sit there reading during class because I was usually so bored. So, so I, I did a lot of that. Um, oh, and then those are the, the friends. Um, uh, oh, also for the, for the class, and be, um, there's something about the age. Um, oh yeah, it, but talking about kindergarten, um, I, one thing was growing up also is that, uh, it, or, or this has to do with the friends too, is that I kind of, for those who got, you know, didn't, you know, was, I was always the shortest one in class. And I always thought I was just really short. So it was funny. I used to actually just drink a lot of milk thinking maybe it'll help me grow. I was like, when I was really, really young. So, but then I actually found out when I was um, 15, um, and at the time you had to be 16 to get your learner's permit. Everybody else in my class was taking driver's ed and they were all getting learner's permit. And I was like, how is it? And then I found out they were all 16. So I realized that I was the youngest one in the class because I have a late September birthday, but somehow my mother still got me into kindergarten, Kindergarten, even though usually the cutoff is August. So I was by far usually the youngest one in the class and then anyone. And I think it might be, she might have gotten me in. I might have known how to read already because I don't remember learning how to read in kindergarten or in first grade. But I, I, pretty, I think I already did know. So I think maybe two books or something, but um so so she got me in early so which actually turned out to be good because i would have been even more bored i guess if i was a, a year older in in classes so so for friends i i tended to you know i always kept to myself but i always found that um let me see and also through um, starting at fifth grade i started moving every two years so i we went to two elementary schools two junior high schools and two high schools because my family we just ended up just kind of moving so I ended up having to kind of, you know, meet new people after fifth grade a lot of times. But I, I, my memories of, I always had, there was always this group of girls I would sit with at lunch. And when I think back at, on it, I have no idea how I was sitting with them at lunch. I, 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 I just, it just kind of happened everywhere. I mean, I would always, I mean, I don't know if they, I would be sitting alone because I'm fine sitting alone and eating and maybe some other kids were more extrovert or whether they might've taken pity on me and they're like, oh, and they sat with me and then they found out that, oh, she's nice and she's interesting. So let's, so I would just sit with them at lunch every day. So, but then I also, I kind of consider they were more to me, they're acquaintances. They weren't really friends because to me, friends are people who you kind of, you, you have a connection with, you hang out with, you talk to, and I never really had a connection with anybody through school. So yeah, that's, a, that's a similar thing with uh, the Cheryl had said is, you know, not having that many friends. So um, let me see, there was something else that somebody mentioned growing up. Oh, oh, um, oh, the, this is another thing is um, um, the observation, kind of self-observation some people have brought up is I always did that when I would notice what other people did and whether I did it. So I, I over time, I would always get better and better at getting along at least with people or not offending you know by noticing well how do they behave how do i behave maybe i should do this maybe i should do that uh one time in high school i was going through some doors and oh when i got to tell you, my, my mother and my father i was born in new york city but I only lived there till i was five and i grew up in dc but this was in virginia beach when i lived there but um one time i bumped into someone in the going through the hallway and i had been raised by my mother is a new yorker my stepfather was a new yorker they're rude New Yorkers. There was no manners. We never said thank you. We never said please. There was no excuse me. There was, you know, they never did any of that. So I bumped into someone and then after that, I'm walking along and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if I should have said, excuse me. I said, you know, if you bump into the wrong person, you never know it because there were actually some problems at school with some, you know, some groups, groups of kids getting mad at each other and maybe fighting and there was stuff going on. So, so, well, maybe it would actually be a good idea if I actually started like saying, excuse me and please and thank you and learning some manners. So I actually started practicing it on my own. And my stepfather actually used to kind of make fun of me sometimes if I would say, excuse me, or <laughs> thank you. So, so, so I, it was that kind of that INT, you know, just, I, I actually thought of doing that rather than just picking it up, which I guess a lot of kids do kind of young, very young naturally, is I actually had to kind of implement that myself. Um, and, oh, and then also the correcting people there, if they were, so the social anxiety didn't extend to the people I knew. So when I went to college, my, um, 
my roommate, well, actually for the first few months, my roommate thought I hated her. Um, she was an extrovert, I think maybe in ESFJ possibly, but she thought I hated her because I didn't talk to her for months because I just, just didn't, you know, I don't know, just very bare minimum talking to her. And then she started bringing, and then I started talking to her. She said, oh, thank God, I thought you hated me. So, um, so I started to, you know, so I was like, no, I just, you know, takes me a while to warm up to people. So she would have like some friends over. And then one time one of them was saying, and I was had, I had my watch and there was, you know, no phone, this is, you know, no phones with time on them, no digital. I had, you know, a watch and I had an alarm clock and I always make sure I would call up the number that you could get the exact time. I'd always have my watch set to the exact time and my clocks always set to the exact time. And then some people would come by and then one time somebody was saying, well, well, what time is it? And they were saying, oh, it's quarter after. I said, oh, no, it's like it's 18 after. And I realized that they got kind of annoyed at that. And then I started thinking, is that, well, maybe it's not so good to be, you know, does it really matter if it's quarter after or it's 18 after? You know, maybe it, it, it doesn't matter. And I was like, if the time, now if they said it was like an hour off, you know, then you could correct it. But if it's a little bit, so I thought, well, how do I get myself out of this habit of doing this kind of correcting thing? And so I set, um, I set my watch and I set my clock to different times that were both incorrect. And they were both early though. So that way I wouldn't be late anywhere. But that was to trying to get myself out of the, the upset, kind of a little bit of obsession, I guess, with the preciseness of something that doesn't really matter that much. So, and I started trying to apply that. And actually I did that with a lot of things, trying to apply that to, uh, to growing up. So actually I got along with people better. And, and actually I, that, that helped growing up, actually having that extrovert roommate who signed me up for every single, she was the captain of all of the intramural college uh, sports teams for our dorm. She signed me up to every single one of the teams <laughs> just to make sure we had enough people on them. So I ended up playing a lot of sports in college just because she signed me up. So that ended up getting me a little, you know, a lot more out of my shell in college of just having an extroverted roommate and just kind of having to associate with more people. So, so. Yeah, it's always nice to have that extrovert to drag the introvert into external activities and interacting with the outer world, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's really interesting, Susan, how you mentioned having to kind of teach yourself or take a deliberate type of approach to learning emotional intelligence techniques. Typically, people pick it up naturally, but mm -hmm. it was kind of like a learned skill or trying to build that over time, which is really interesting. Yeah, I could see that with my kids because I know they would just pick it up in school because a lot of they would start saying please and thank you a lot more than i mean we never try and force them to say it so much we would um, model it for them but not but i could tell you know going to school they would like pick that up from maybe other kids and teachers and things so yeah mm -hmm. very very cool oh yeah nice to you wanted to say something <laughs> oh yeah um actually i just wanted to ask everybody here uh did you also start developing earlier than um, than everybody else uh, in in your family at least, because everybody was surprised of how early I started talking. Um, I started talking before I even reached um, one year old. Is what my mother said. I, I can't remember, but then she said I stressed my parents out so much they had to send me to school at two because I just wanted to learn and they couldn't stay at home for me. And so like, I, I was always the youngest in my classes too. Yeah. Is it also like, is it like a, a tray that we have since we're young? It's, this is very fascinating. I have my brothers, my sisters and mine baby books. And I think I was the earliest one to talk out of the three. Because I think, was it, yeah. I don't remember. I, I remember getting praise for being smart. I was an only grandchild, so I got a lot of attention that way. Uh, mm -hmm. um, however, I, I think the precociousness that is what I would call what you're describing, Misu, is the, that, that I think depends, depends a, a lot on genes and all kinds of other things, you know, like some people have things happen in, in the womb that affect development. Uh, and in well, I am neurodivergent. Like I'm on the high functioning autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think that may vary a bit. 
in terms of type. I see, I see. When, when it comes to that, I think it also it's a matter of perception of and what your expectations are. Because mm -hmm. I know that I was perceived as older than I was in certain ways. And I think that was just because they expected me to be more extroverted or more obviously childish in ways I was not. Like I had access to mm -hmm. books, like encyclopedias and that kind of stuff very early. And so I was sitting with that instead of playing with mod. So I don't think that makes me <laughs> early. I think it's just a difference of interest versus what people would expect to see. Yeah, and I played with mud a lot. <laughs> I played with mud too. <laughs> I made mud pies. And, and well, I, I've been told that if I got mud or jam or something on my fingers, I would sit like this until someone came. And <laughs> I, I collected a lot of bugs when I was young. Oh yeah. I, I like tried to find frogs in the creek. I would ditch church. Uh, I, um, the uh, class, yeah, the what do you call that? After you know, during church, you go to a classroom. So, um, and I would ditch it, and I would go down to the creek and try to look for frogs. <laughs> and I had to keep uh, my dress pretty clean. <laughs> what do you call this insect? Uh, semi. Um, it's the insect that screams in summer, semi cicada. Cicada? Yeah, cicada, mm. yeah. Yeah. I had like I had like a multiple jars of cicada shells. Oh. And I would collect them. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to see all the variations of the cracks of the shell and like how big they were. I would compare them to each other. And like that was that was the reason why everybody was creeped out by me. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of dead stuff in my room. Um, I don't know how common and common that is, but that I think you see more of that from boys. Like ah, just yeah, somebody collecting weird shit they find outside. Like I remember when I was really young, I was capturing bumblebees with my fingers, and I don't know how I did that, mm. but I didn't burn. <laughs> That was my pet now. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions you can ask to see if someone is a thinker but a female is to ask them if they felt a little different than the gender norms, like if they felt like they didn't completely fit into like the feminine stereotypes of being a female. Because a lot of like thinker females will have kind of like stereotypically guyish traits because 75% of thinkers tend to be men and 75% of feelers tend to be women. And so there's this like stereotypes that build off of that. And when someone doesn't exactly fit the stereotypes of their gender, one of the reasons why that is the case could be because they're a thinker female out of the many reasons. There could be other reasons why too. <laughs> I think I only started becoming more aware of gender stereotype like later teens like i think that was the time that i was more approachable to talk to <laughs> for the people around me unfortunately and so that was when all the realization came like oh uh, okay so all the negative um negative reactions i got from people was because they didn't i wasn't what they expected me to be yeah hmm all right. Thank you for answering my query. <laughs> there's a there's a little bit of issue around the statistics, though. Thank because you. Because the measurement error on the Myers Briggs type indicator, where a lot of that data came from, is pretty high. And so I don't know that it, that 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 percentage is still accurate. Mm, or if it is I accurate. I see. I also read that a lot of the Myers-Briggs percentages studies was they they tested it on like high school, mostly high school and university uh, subjects. And usually that's the most extroverted mm -hmm. time in people's lives. And like they usually plateau after they've gone out of the system. And so a lot of a lot of the introvert to extrovert ratio is very raw. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they, the, the, the earliest studies were a Philadelphia high school. And that was be, way before the a Philadelphia high school looked like what a Philadelphia high school would look like right now, inner city. 
But th that, that kind of study, that was the first normative study. But then there have been attempts to do it over and over again. And the, when they created the, the latest version of the Myers-Briggs, they did a random digit dialing thing. So they call you up on the phone and ask if you'll take it. And, uh, and it turns out that the, the modal type with that study was ISFJ. And I said, well, wait a minute, modal being the most frequent. And, and I said, but I may answer the phone and say, yeah, I'll do it. And then it sits on the pile under my desk and I never get around to it. So I don't throw the dollar <laughs> away, but I feel guilty. Mm. So there are all these um, sampling biases that come into play. So you can't really talk about what is the distribution. What we, what we do know about thinking and feeling is that the modal expectate the, the definitions of the feeling preference the way those are defined match what is expected in western culture and maybe eastern culture i can't speak to that of yeah, women, yeah. Of women. Mm -hmm. and and what is there about the thinking preference is what is expected in western culture of men and um I'm safe to say I'm the oldest one here, but uh, Rebecca said that later on she got more more attuned to other people's feelings. And I think some of that I got in my master's degree training to be a counselor and then working closely with people with the NFJ preferences, like my daughter, <laughs> who, <laughs> who now works with me in the business, where I got a lot of extra coaching <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and my business partner at one point had I, yeah, ENFJ preferences. And so, mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's this whole type development piece. So some people will follow a kind of a, a natural evolution of their type preferences and others may not. But, you know, later in life, we're likely to see things quite different than we are from earlier. And I think that we're seeing type development happening younger in people from what I am observing. At or least it's in my easier grade. to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I see the younger people that come into the courses aren't so narrowly defined as they were with the stereotypes that were prevalent <laughs> when I was learning and teaching it. Yeah, so. That makes a, a whole lot of sense for sure. This is a good example of TI kind of going like, well, actually, this is the <laughs> <Yeah>. case. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. You'll, I was so glad we'll, when Linda Barron spoke up. I'm like, oh, good, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, you know, I wouldn't have known some of that stuff if I hadn't been a doctoral student and, you know, studied research methodologies. And if I hadn't done the MBA hadn't been teaching the MBTI qualifying program for years and years. No, so. mm. But that's enough of my sermon. <laughs> I think a lot of statistical, there's a lot of statistical bias with a lot of information too. There's a course I'm taking right now. It's a statistics course. Our course instructor is most likely a TI dom. And <laughs> one of our first readings is how most of the studies you read online are wrong because they're conducted poorly. And so there is this uh, paper she she linked to us, which I'll link below too, is how a lot of medical journals are actually conducted in favor of the drug so that people will buy the drug, but they're not actually accurate data on the drug. It's just skewed information to make the drug look good. And I'm like, wow, this is such like controversial information to be teaching us as a class. But like as a TI Dom, she was like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna teach you all this. And it's also like, she was, it was highly, highly controversial information, but it's true. Cause it was like, there was a lot of backing to her point. And it just reminds me of that restorative quality of, of, of TI and how it's trying to point out errors in thinking and it does it well and it's fascinating for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but that's pretty much the same thing like correlation versus causality. Just because there is a course correlation doesn't doesn't mean that that causes this to be true. Mm -hmm. Like those statistics were and that ISFJ thing Linda said earlier. 
like if you decide this means that then you can say this means that but that doesn't mean it's actually true right so, so i always get kind of bristly about you know which types make the best partners and all of that it's like yeah there's too many other factors have to do oh. with with <laughs> longevity of relationships you know that yeah. that is something i get a lot on my twitter account like just random people messaging me asking me hello i am this type and type i would like to date this type would that be a good match and i'm like i don't know i do not know you <laughs> please well, and please do not ask me <laughs> my my answer would be it it would be a different set of problems for each case mm, mm -hmm. or a different set of joys for each case mm. Uh, before I would just I would try to be as polite as I can. I'm like maybe it's more so not your type, but like your upbringing, your yeah. comfort levels, and like what kind of what kind of attachment theory you have. But then I guess like a lot of more people saw that I was very friendly online, and they kept asking. Me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very yeah. It was a very strange experience, and it was my first time on English Twitter. <laughs> mm. People are very forward in the English Twitter sphere. <laughs> well, and people want answers. Yeah, that's true. You know, mm. like that's why type is often misused in organizations. You don't know, want to hire this person you know, it's because yeah. people want mm. answers, and then they aren't what? comfortable with managing complexity. The thing is with the official mbti like when people are, are certified they're told to never use like type as a instrument to hire or promote someone that it's highly 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 unethical and so it's weird when people take something similar and they try to use it as a way to discriminate against new hires mm -hmm. or stuff because with people who are actually like have a lot of history with the tool they'll know that it's against the tool to use it for that purpose and so it's kind of like an alchemist, you know, an alchemist has an alchemist code where it's like never try to make a, a dead human back to life. And so it's like this, like that, it's, it's unethical, like it's al alchemists are not allowed to do that. The same thing is with, you know, people who practice the 16 types, like there's a code between us all that's kind of like, don't use it for hiring or promoting, but some people still do it. And it's like, it doesn't speak for the, the rest of us <laughs> like mm -hmm. it doesn't like one bad cookie doesn't mean that we're all bad cookies yeah, well, yeah. that's also illegal in many yeah. states it's illegal so if if an org you know, you're working with an organization and they decide they want to do that you can you know it's your job to tell them that you're opening yourself up for a lawsuit yeah so if you see your company using it for unethical reasons you can let them know that it might open them up to a lawsuit. <laughs> I, guess it's I, I recently fine. told one of the new students about that because he was sort of doing that with friends of you know, <laughs> who had, they were asking him, should I hire this person? Should I not? And I said, mm -hmm. you can't answer that question. So, yeah. yeah. I was thinking, I guess I'm not surprised in that the uh, hedge fund I interviewed with years ago, um, I went through a couple of rounds of interviews, technical interview, everything was great. They thought everything was great. The last thing you do is you have to take this test. They gave it to me and it wasn't the Myers-Briggs, but it was a personality test. And then I never heard from them again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. And I, I, I keep track of them and it's like, I don't know if anything happens in the market, if hedge funds blow up, it's like, I hope they're one of them. Cause I just like, I'm still kind of <laughs> irritated by that. And they also, it also irritated me that I never found out the results of the test. It drives me nuts. <laughs> Cause even if mm. they didn't want to hire me based on, I still want to know what the results were. So I have no idea. So it's mm. <laughs> the results that you were and, and then also what, what they were actually looking for, like, and yeah, how, they, how they didn't match. They wanted to hire only J types. I don't know, you know, people who were more organized or something. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. when there's so many misunderstandings about that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they were probably misusing it too, and they're probably also just, you know, not doing a good job of hiring also. So, so, so. Joyce, if your goal was to help people see what INTP is like, we've done a good job of demonstrating one of our <laughs> gifts as well as one of our downfalls. <laughs> yeah, troubleshooting people's thoughts. <laughs> it's like, hey, mm. this is inaccurate. 
actually uh, it's this. <laughs> there's, there's also an introverted feeling aspect that to, to me mm -hmm. because it, it, it does harm. It does. Yeah. And so it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like if a, if a type of way of thinking is going to spread like the chicken pox, then you want to prevent the chicken pox from spreading a lot. And so mm -hmm. it's almost like a civil duty INTPs have to kind of <laughs> correct your, correct your logic. <laughs> all right. So interesting discussion, everyone. Thank you for all of the, <laughs> all of the rooting, <laughs> rooting out the inaccuracies <laughs> that's going on. And so what are the gifts that you bring to the world? What are things that INTPs bring to the ecosystem of life? Mm, it's a lot of utilizing TI mainly to not really like fact check everything, but just to see it's a lot of troubleshooting other people's uh, established beliefs, just systems, or a lot of like um, even culture. Uh, I'm not so sure how it is in the Western world, but INTPs are not very well liked in Japan. <laughs> um, I remember seeing this one tweet about this very popular account that says, oh, well, generally NTP types are not very popular in Japan, which is a very big FE valuing society. Um, we have this thing called honne and patemai. Honne is like true meaning of what you say behind your words. And uh, no, patemai is like a facade. So like you have to be polite to everybody. You, there are things that you say just out of courtesy. And um, the account said like NTPs break this and it makes everybody in the Japanese village mindset incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> but the gift is a lot of the directness actually solves society's problems. So why don't you adapt it? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's a lot of um, ideas that kind of fix holes in, in systems, if only we are given the chance to do so. It's, it's a lot of allowing for the, for the troubleshooting to work, you know? And um, from where I am, there's a lot of pushback to that because <laughs> um, certain things have to be followed. There's a lot of like respecting other people's comfort levels or the, the majority of society's comfort levels, which is not very much <laughs> yeah but solving problems really really and truly like um literal world problems and maybe also like philosophical quandaries possibly mm. so that's my that's my take on that that's a very nice take <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Anyone else want to comment on INTP gifts, strengths? Mm. I guess I guess I can go. Mm. Uh, I think it, it's similar, like the gifts of anyone else, where we keep track of things in a way not everyone else do all the time. So we will see th things like problems pop up on the radar in ways people might not notice, like someone is about to make a mistake or they have set things in, up in such a way that it will cause problems or people tell us their thinking and from our perspective it can be as simple as why did you read it that way so we're sort of maybe accident accidentally helping clarify things for yourself and accidentally giving it to others which is like a double-edged sword because sometimes people like it, other times they're not ready to hear it, or they read it as they're being challenged, as we have heard earlier in this talk. And I guess that's like the blessing and the curse of the type. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me, um, 
there are a couple of things. The theme that Dario Nardi and I came up with for INTP is designer theorizer. So some of it is about designing something that's that's different. And some of that I think is the kind of the problem solving um, that's more strategic, more than tactical. And um, so elegant solutions are really important to me. And the, um, the theorizing shows up, uh, I've been having some health issues. I have autoimmune diseases and um, they seem to have reared up a lot in the last few months, but I've been really noticing how I don't think I could stand to go to a traditional medical doctor because I had to go to one and they were kind of poo-pooing me, but the one I go to is a functional medicine physician who wants to get at the root cause of things. And so I'm constantly analyzing everything. And, and it's that constant analysis, looking for clues until I get this little kachink. So right now there's a multifaceted issue going on with my gut. And um, finally, the I never remember the name of the doctor, but one doctor named, named what, what they found in the colonoscopy. And then it, everything else fell into place. And then I figured out, oh, now I know when this started. This started when I started with a detox program and that's when it happened. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. And so uh, luckily my doctor trusts me and so she'll listen to me if I have some kind of detection and some kind of information. At least so far, she hasn't gotten too frustrated with me. But there is that kind of capacity to see things that fit and things that don't. So in the theory world, that's you know uh, what I often bring is clarity. So that there's clarity to, this is really not introverted thinking. This really goes with theorist, or this really, this may be an interaction style influence that we see going on here like for all of us behind the scenes. Well, not Joyce, but you know, for, the, for the rest of us. And so there's, there's um, that kind of discernment and ruling out what doesn't fit. And I actually have no patience for what seems to not fit, um, which is not a good thing <laughs> but necessarily until somebody brings it up and then I can find it. And so. Rebecca has brought in a whole lot of other things now that I have to start thinking about. <laughs> so, so she's she's fragmented my brain a bit. But anyway, it's that kind of, not, it isn't just problem solving, it's really complex problem solving of complex issues. Yeah, can, can I just add my own anecdote to that? Um, like I also have auto, autoimmune issues and I had to move and I got a new doctor. And a 15 minute consultation to renew a prescription turned into a 90 minute argument and where I just had to solve it by asking him questions. He couldn't say no to, is this true? Yes. Is this true? Yes. Like he couldn't say no, he would be lying. And at the end, he didn't want to talk to me anymore. Like he just told me he was going to call me back and we argued for another hour on the phone in the evening and I got my prescription. So yeah. Yeah we have our our ways I guess and then you have like what traditional doctors do and then there's all the other stuff you can know about which yeah theorist yeah. stuff I guess yeah um so for me I've always kind of had this but I've really grown into it over time and it's kind of what Linda alluded to but I call it the um interdisciplinary aspect. And it's, I look at it as the extroverted intuiting combined with the introverted thinking. And so it's the ability to take on all these different perspectives that come from all these different disciplines and understand how they fit together. And just over the past week, I've been watching um, some videos of presenters and it's like, nope, that's too limited. They're only thinking about this one thing. And nope, they're, 
and and so what I'm looking for is, and I, and I think it's because of the complexity piece. I love complexity science. And so um, understanding that no matter how we want to approach something in today's highly complex world, um, you can't do it from a single discipline. And so I feel I, I really thrive in, um, in that kind of environment. And then the challenge is to distill it down to a manageable message to other people, right? Um, because no one else wants to do the same work that I love doing. I shouldn't say no one else, but there aren't that many other people who want to do the same um, work that I'm doing. They just want, just tell me your conclusions. They, they don't want to take that whole journey um, with me. It's like drinking in the nuance of like many aspects. I, I heard like a lot of high, high stack NE people are not everybody. It's like, it's definitely not the prerequisites to be typed NPs, but like a lot of high stack NE people are very geared to being polymaths, like just liking different maybe related topics or you know like being good in a lot of different aspects in life or in just an interest yeah for sure and so cheryl and susan do you guys have any closing thoughts before we end the panel yeah so about the with the, the gifts and this is actually a bigger a perspective of you know, work in the business world, working world, and all of that. Um, we, it is, and it reflects some on what others said. Of we, we tend to be good at analyzing other people's ideas and thoughts. And and my actually general view now, in the last few years, I realize is our gifts are exactly what makes us disliked by people a lot of times, at least in the working world. Um, is that we will, they have so much, like I've had this happen so many times, they will come up with a project, we're going to do this, we're going to do that and all that. And I, if I'm uncertain about something, I don't say anything. So I, if I actually speak up about something, I'm pretty sure I'm right. So I have spoken up about things where it's like, no, I don't, this isn't going to you know, work. And, and if, oh, there it goes, it doesn't work, it doesn't have, and then I, you know, I, I, and I can tell I get resented for being right about them being wrong and not doing things correctly so and i try and i i try and do it as gently as nicely as you know every the way i should do it i don't know how and also i don't know how much of that's because i'm an intp woman rather than an intp man i really do think if i was an intp man i would get listened to a lot more usually i'm the only woman and just about any team any meeting any organization, I can have a call where we have 50 people on it, and I'll be the only woman. So, I, yeah, frequently, unless the people who have worked with me the most closely for long periods of time, they would be more likely to listen to me. But the men who, who haven't, a lot of times they won't. And it's, you know, so it's that being able to kind of cut through, see patterns. And as I said, I see, yes, yeah, sometimes something will happen where I've seen this before, and I know we're going down this road where it's not going to have a bad um, result. I mean, and, and they'll still just keep churning along. And the person who did it, usually when it fails, they end up getting promoted. So I just, <laughs> you know, they, they figure out a way to say it wasn't their fault and it, and it works out fine for them anyway. So it's kind of this, the, the, the curse of the INTP in a lot of ways, they were kind of the Cassandras of the world um, where we can see things. And it's not just that, it's not a psychic thing. It's just that we, we see things and we're like, Oh, you know, we just can see it's going, just going, this is going to go wrong or this is, you know, something's going to happen. And, but, but people don't want to listen to us because even if we can delineate exactly why they still just don't want to hear that. Mm. So, yeah. I've had that too. Like, do we really want to hit this iceberg a third time? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I or, or they have this project, they've had countless meetings, countless people working on it. And then you ask one question. Oh, they can't do it anyway, because nobody thought of that. Yeah. And of mm -hmm. course, then you have a whole group of people 
who are very unhappy that you knocked their project by accident because I wasn't like trying to shit on their work. I just saw a problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a friend yeah. in college who I got them to make their mon I told them their mantra should be my life would be so much easier if I just listened to Susan. Because I told them, I said, I usually won't say anything unless I think you're probably doing the wrong thing. And it's like, and then I will tell them and then they'll go do it anyways. And then something terrible happens and they're like, oh, and I'm like, I'm not going to say I told you so. I, just thought, yeah. I, th I think one of the common um, themes that a lot of us have hit on is when we deliver that you know, introverted thinking, <laughs> when we communicate and we're kind of coming from that place, which is just innate for us, um, we've learned that there needs to be like this kind of candy coating on the outside. And I, I think of it like as a, the extroverted feeling function and de learning to develop and consider how will the receive, you know, how will this be received on the other end? And so when you deliver that information, it's, it's often could be Consider, you know, considered like a criticism to other people and highly offensive. So it's it's careful crafting and considering what information needs to be delivered or like, you know, do you do they need this information? Is it going to help them? And then how can I express it in a way that they will accept? Because if if you like, I find that if I try to help somebody, but they um, are offended in some way, then the information doesn't get conveyed. And so it was sort of pointless to even attempt to, to say it. So if the communication is not going to be effective, then it's, um, yeah, I mean, what's the point? So for me, it's a, it's a matter of, I think of it as like, a, you know, those pills that you take, sometimes they're like, sweet on the outside and then but if you leave them in your mouth long enough they're really bitter it's like how do you get this information that people need that otherwise is, might be considered to be quite bitter but you sort of put this candy coating on the outside and um that's sort of how i see being an effective communicator and helper using introverted you know the introverted thinking function as an intp or as a female with intp preferences um but yeah I, I, the one thing I guess I wanted to add, because I don't think that it was really brought up, is um, is that you know as an I, as someone with INTP preferences and as a mother um, that I've I've learned to have like I really had to grow in the emotional intelligence department mm -hmm. because my motivation was I want my children to grow up and be you know happy, well adjusted people who feel loved and um there was not really anything in my life that was ever more motivating than to want to be a good mother um and so um yeah i guess that's it i think that one of the things like i'll just give like an example i took the back of the toilet the cover off because i was looking to see what was going on with it and see if i could make some adjustments um to it and I decided that I would just leave the cover off for a while because I wanted my kids to have the opportunity to just see what happens in the back of the toilet and how it works. And, um, and just to like be able to explore with things I was never allowed to explore when I was a kid. Um, so, so for me, I think that it's a little bit of probably a different experience for my kids growing up with me than for a lot of their friends, but there, there are advantages, I think, to having someone who allows you to explore um, just like a scientist, like to be a little scientist. And that's all. Mm. So the lesson of sugarcoating is when I hear a lot from the TPs and TJs, they're like, you got to deliver that TI in, in the INTP's case. They're truth taco to people in a way where they accept it and they don't like push it out of your hand. And it's like, hey, but my tooth, my, my truth taco, that's not fair. And so it's like figuring out that sugarcoating to the other, otherwise bitter pill that Cheryl was talking about, which is really brilliantly put, uh, trying to find a way to convey the truth in a way where other people will accept. Yeah, yeah. I think that the sugarcoating sometimes can feel like sugarcoating and fake. So it's really- It what does I a get, lot. Yeah, which I mm -hmm. got from my, mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of coaching from my daughter as we work together about 
you know, what, what people's real concerns are behind what, you know, and then how to address that a little bit. So I have like a built-in coach that helps. Mm -hmm. yeah, and also yeah. if, if their ego is attached to the idea, it doesn't matter how much sugar you put on it, they're, they're gonna be hurt yeah. regardless. Yeah. yeah, so those are good tips finding an FE coach or just accepting that if something hits someone's ego or identity, it doesn't matter how nice you say it, it, it just won't go through. I'm really, sorry, really works. <laughs> Apologies work. Mm, yeah, that's actually one thing that I had to learn later on in life when socializing is like how to effectively apologize and how to be sincere and actually mean it. Like those are two separate lessons that I've I've yeah. learned. Never start with like, I'm sorry that you blah, 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 feel this way. Like it's, that's not good. So I've, mm. I've learned to be more direct with like, cause it's, it's better for me to state what I just did. Cause it's also a fact to me, you know? So like for me, it's just like stating what actually happened and then apologizing for it. Yeah. yeah, I love this train of thought, but because we're also short on time, <laughs> I'm going to have to also end the panel. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. It's really nice to see how it's like to think for yourself. I feel like you are all very good exemplars of what it means to think for yourself and to have a mind of your own and to really clarify and make people's thinking more pure and logical <laughs> rather than tainted with irrationality or bias or cognitive error. So you all purify people's thinking, which is an amazing skill to have. It's almost like a, a water purifier. You purify the water so people can drink it. Otherwise, if people drink water that is filled with pollutants, they could die. And so the same ways with our thoughts, right? If we give people bad thoughts, they could potentially cause harm or suffering onto another person, eventually of those. So what INTPs help us with is really creating thought patterns that upgrade society and create a better living conditions for us all. Even if the initial hearing of the logical error can cause a bitterness on a person's emotions, in the long term, you provide us the beliefs and the ideas that really are vetted and checked through your rigorous theorist theorizing. <laughs> and, and so it's nice to see the TI, SI hair splitting at work. So it's like taking a point and then like thin slicing it and like trying to break it down to its fundamental parts to see like what specific parts really don't make sense, which is why you all are able to see the complexity of an idea because you're able to break it down so much that you're able to build it up in a greater amount of complexity too. And nuance that other people may not always consider and so thank you for putting so much fact checking into your thoughts so other people can feel the benefit of you knowing your stuff <laughs> and, and being right and being so smart and being so well knowledgeable and correcting you know, the things that society takes for granted. So there's a lot of group think in life. And so there's a lot of consensus thinking that is errored. And so you all are able to really cut at the heart of that and provide a nuanced take that can get people to reconsider something they've taken for granted. So that's amazing and it helps everyone. And I, I gotta love you on TV Sport. And so thank you, Linda Behrens, for creating an interstrength certification program where you teach people about the interaction styles and you provide nuance and complexity to type theory. A really cool addition I, I liked about your theory was how ESTPs are the in charge type in your interaction mm. styles. Yeah, which is often the ESTPs on my panel will complain about getting mistyped by people as ENTJ because they have this in charge type of style. But your interaction styles explains why ESTPs often accidentally get typed as TE DOM, but they're they're just in charge, but it doesn't mean that they use TE. <laughs> yeah. So it provides that magnificent layer of depth to type so people can type more accurately. And yeah, thank you everyone for, for the panel. And Suzanne, it is nice to know that 
you you have a YouTube channel as an INTP female because there are not a lot of INTP females who put themselves out there. A lot of them are very shy. I have had the hardest time wrangling INTP females to, to meet together. It was very hard finding you guys, like, very <laughs> hard. <laughs> it's a lot of, um, I know my thoughts and like, I don't need to broadcast them kind of mindset. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have to play the role of like dragging out your brilliance and going like, hey, hey, come up, come up. <laughs> and Naisu, you have like a really amazing Twitter feed and you're just a really great part of the type community. And it's nice reading Thank your you. thoughts from time to time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of them are satire because Mm, a lot of people come into type just knowing about stereotypes. So I like breaking down the stereotypes through humor. <laughs> that's as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And it fills up my heart cup when you always tell me how you've been following my YouTube series for such a long time. It's so <laughs> nice. You're like from the beginning, you're the original. I don't know. You're. you're, you're mm -hmm. There's a, a special place in my heart for you. <laughs> yeah, that warms up my heart too. But it's like <laughs> INTPs at the end of the day, we're still FE users. So, you know, when we do corrections, it's really not for us. It's more like thinking about other people, but like aggressively thinking about other people. <laughs> it's the approach. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. thank you for your work too. Really, it's it brings a lot of nuance into the type community. Mm. Oh, thank you, Heart. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Susan, for, for coming out. <laughs> it's yeah, it was nice meeting you and your ENTJ friend. It's nice how like you went on tangent land when we met and you're like, oh, this cool thought and this cool thought. And that cool thought. And then your ENTJ friend was like, all right, the main point. Let's let's talk about the main point. <laughs> that was a really lovely chat. It was great yeah. getting to know you and how most people are kind of like acquaintances to you until like they meet the friend threshold. Yeah. yeah. And so thank you for that, Susan. And Cheryl. <laughs> I really liked your bitter pill metaphor for INTPs. Or I think TI domes would relate to it. And it's like giving this harsh truth to people, which is the reality of the situation. And it's kind of like pointing out the problems or pointing out the, the weak parts of, of what's happening and, and people not taking it well because they get offended. And so sometimes the TI Dom's like, what did I just cause? <laughs> but it's from stating just their opinion. And, and so the, the bitter pill gives this imagery to otherwise a vague phenomenon that, you know, INTPs go through. So that was really spot on. That takes the cake for metaphors tonight. So yeah, Thank thanks, you. Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's nice to have you on. You're also very brave to come on, even though it's a new experience for you. And it's, it's growth that inspires the INTPs watching this to also reach out of their comfort zone and to try something that will grow them in the long run too. So you'll inspire INTPs who are shy like you to also do things that may stretch them, but in a good way. So that's awesome. <laughs> and thank you, Rebecca, <laughs> for, for coming out and making it to this panel. I appreciate it. And hearing your, sto your story about dating is very interesting too. And I find often sometimes with most INTPs, dating finds them rather than them proactively searching for dating. <laughs> so that was a heck of a relatable experience for a lot of people watching. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. And so thank you viewers for tuning in to this lovely episode. And thank you everyone for coming out. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.